Good afternoon to everyone who's uh, joining us and logging in. We are about to get started in a minute or two. In the meantime, uh, let us know where you're from in the chat, and uh, we're glad you're with us. Okay, we have people from throughout the world. We have people in Jerusalem and Israel, a number of people in New England and the Pacific Northwest, people in Georgia, New York City. Uh, we're so glad that Germany, California, uh, many people in New England. We're glad that you're all with us today. Um, okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Avram Grohl, and I serve as executive director of jewishgen.org, which is an affiliate of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's Jewish Gen Talk, uh, part of our continuing series on uh, about Jewish families in America. And today's talk will focus on Jewish roots in New England. Just a couple of notes before we get started. Number one, the session is being recorded. So if you have to jump off, or if you know of anyone who couldn't participate, uh, we'll be loading this video recording onto our YouTube channel. We'll try to get that done uh, by tomorrow. And we'll post a, an announcement when it's been done on the Jewish Gen discussion group. So if you're not on the Jewish Gen discussion group, please take this as an opportunity and an opportune time to join the group. It's a, a wonderful way of connecting with thousands of people throughout the world and a way of staying informed of things that are happening in the Jewish genealogical community. Uh, finally, there is a handout which has been uh, emailed uh, in the email reminders that you received today. I'm also going to post another link in the chat momentarily. And with that, I welcome our panelists and I pass it on to Ellen Coet, who is our Jewish Gen Director of United States Research. Um, actually, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, we do encourage questions along the way. Uh, if you have anything to ask, please post them in the Q&A on the bottom of the screen. And we hope that there will be time at the end of the presentations to field some of the questions. Please try to keep them uh, as general as possible. And uh, we'll be glad to try to answer as many as we can. So with that, I thank you for being with us and I pass it over to Ellen. Thank you, Abraham. We're all happy to be here today. Welcome, everyone. I am actually uh, based in Colorado, have a little bit of a cold, so I'll try to articulate my words. Um, as Avrami said, I am director of Jewish Gen's USA Research Division, and I'm a national vice chair of a recently created Jewish task force for the Daughters of the American Revolution. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our panelists. Rachel King is executive director of the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at New England Historic Genealogical Society, which is an archive and educational center specializing in the history of Jewish families, institutions, and communities in New England. Prior to leading the JHC, she worked at the Jewish Women's Archive. Rachel is a graduate of Brown University and has a master's degree from Columbia University. Caitlin LaRoche is executive director of the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Association. She is a graduate of Rhode Island College and has a master's degree in public and applied history from Southern New Hampshire University. Elizabeth Rose, PhD, is a historian with interest in Jewish women's and family history and has written two books on the history of childcare and early education in the United States. She has worked with genealogists, both as library director at the Fairfield Museum and History Center, and in her current role with the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Hartford. Harris Gleckman is director of Documenting Maine Jewry, a community-based history project providing information on Jewish citizens of Maine through a state-of-the-art genealogical and historical resource. He received his BA and PhD from Brandeis University. 
Lindsay Spreckman Murphy is senior archivist at the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center. She received a BA in history from UNC Chapel Hill and an MLIS from Simmons University. I'd like to welcome you all today. And we're going to begin with Rachel King. Take it away, Rachel. Thank you so much, Ellen. And I wanna start by thanking Jewish Jen for organizing this webinar. It's such a pleasure partnering with you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's exciting to see all the places that um, folks are, are um, tuning in from. Uh, as Ellen said, my name is Rachel King. I'm the executive director of the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at New England Historic Genealogical Society in Boston. Uh, we are an archive and educational center um, focused on New England Jewish history. We are located at um, New England Jewish His uh, Historic Genealogical Society, America's founding genealogical organization. Um, and as genealogists, you may be familiar with NEHGS, as we call it, or you may know us as American Ancestors, uh, which is the name of our website and our programmatic arm. Um, there are a lot of names um, and acronyms and initials, um, but for today, uh, we hope you'll get to know the Jewish Heritage Center at NEHGS. Um, and you'll meet my colleague, Lindsay Murphy, um, our senior archivist uh, later in the program to tell us, tell you about our collections and resources um, that are of particular value to Jewish genealogists. But my role today, uh, is to introduce you to the New England Jewish History Collaborative. We, um, we are a group of New England-based Jewish history organizations that came together in 2019 to uh, shed light on and raise awareness of the unique history of Jewish New England and the resources available to study it. We were inspired by the efforts of repositories and organizations in the South to make known Jew Southern Jewish history, and we wanted to do the same for New England. Um, what we innovated together was um, creating a comprehensive resource guide for Jewish New England um, and a website. Uh, which is sort of one-stop shopping for um, the resources available on um, New England Jewish history. Uh, the collaborative held a kickoff event at the beginning of this year in January to introduce scholars and the public to our work and to the wealth of information available about New England Jewish history. We are planning more events to come and we are delighted to be here today to represent the collaborative as well as our individual repositories um, and to share these with um, a genealogical audience. Uh, just to introduce you to the members of the New England Jewish uh, History Collaborative in alphabetical order by state, um, they are, we are the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Hartford in uh, Connecticut. Uh, documenting Maine Jewry, the Jewish Genealogical Society of Greater Boston, the Jewish Historical Society of Western Massachusetts, the Jewish Federation of New Hampshire, the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Association, and Vermont Jewry, the Lost Mural Project. There are two collaborative members, uh, member organizations that have a regional and national focus. My organization, the Jewish Heritage Center, spans New England Jewish history, and um, the Jewish Cemetery Association of North, North America is currently based in New England, but has a national focus. They are a member as well of the collaborative. You can find all of us and our contact information on the collaboratives website, uh, nejhc.org. So speaking of which, I am now pleased to introduce Kate Lynn LaRoche, uh, director of the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Association, who designed the collaboratives website and will walk you through it. Um, she will then discuss her organization's collections of note for genealogists. So Caitlin, uh, without further ado, do you want to um, show us the um, New England Jewish History Collaborative's website and how to use it? Of course, thank you so much for your introduction, Rachel. 
I am going to share my screen with everyone so you can all see our wonderful website, um, including our, our logo that I also created. Um, this is the New England Jewish History Collaborative's website, um, our homepage um, with each of our respective pages that you can click on just from the homepage, or you can go up to the top here and click on um, whichever page you would want to go from. Um, Caitlin, I you think can, you have the wrong it, screen. Caitlin, I think you're looking at your oh. notes, not the PowerPoint. Oh. Okay. Uh, apparently, my computer is not wanting to do it. Let me see that again. There we go. Okay, here we go. Are we looking at the right screen now? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. So from the homepage, you can navigate to each of the six New England states. Um, so we've got Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont, um, and then the homepage. Um, this stays up at the top from each page. So say you wanted to go to Massachusetts um, to look for something, um, but then you decided you wanted to go to Vermont, you can still go from there, um, from that page. Um, so each page has um, three different sections. Um, we've got early days, current information, and historical resources. Um, the early days kind of gives a short overview of where initial settlers um, set up communities, synagogues, um, cemeteries, that whole, uh, like where they had their initial communities in each New England state. Um, and each of the six pages has this as their first part, um, in addition to having some photos at the top too. Um, and the photos kind of give just a brief overview of what we, of the collaborative, what each of our groups has in our collections for photos, because um, you know, genealogists, we all love to, who has photos that we can look through. So um, if you want to look through some photos, we do have some that you can look through, not a lot to begin with, but there are some. Um, the current information gives you the option to look through what we have, what each state has as far as colleges, universities, um, Jewish day schools, um, like Jewish community centers, things like that, that might have current information, but also potential repositories for archival information um, where you can find genealogical resources. Um, additionally to that, historical resources would also give you the archives, um, even more like libraries, things like that, that would have a genealogical material for you to find there. Um, there is also on the main homepage um, as Rachel mentioned, our uh, PDF version of the NEJHC resource guide. So this is a printable version if you'd rather have something tangible to hold in your hand rather than using the website. Um, so feel free to peruse around the website. Um, it has a lot of information. It's chock full of hundreds of different links um, for each of the different states in New England, um, but for Rhode Island, um, I'm going to go into our little presentation for my organization, the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Association, um, and just go a little bit over what we have in our collection for genealogists. Um, we have the longest history of a Jewish presence in New England, um, beginning in the 1650s in Newport. Um, we don't have any resources from that far back. But we do have um, our earliest documents are from the 1780s um, and they are from King David's Masonic Lodge in Newport, Rhode Island. And they are payment documents um, which mention names such as Moses Michael Hayes, Colonel John Topham and Moses Sakesis, um, who if you are from Rhode Island or know anything about Rhode Island's Jewish history, they were um, they were very big in Rhode Island's Jewish history, especially in Newport, um, as far as being merchants and um, starting up the with Toro synagogue and 
the, the most famous part of Rhode Island's Jewish history. Um, the RIJHA, we started back in 1951 and we commonly like to tell the story that we started out of milk crates in the back of a station wagon. And uh, we've, built, we've grown to have our own archive now. Um, we participated in a remodel in our JCC building here in Providence back in 2017. And we have an actual archive now where all of our records are held. Um, we have over 5,000 photographs, um, 12,000 plus obituary collection, and uh, dozens of personal collections, synagogue records, organizational records, hospital records. Um, we also have orphanage records from the Jewish Orphanage of Rhode Island, um, which was defunct in the 1940s, um, as well as a library with books that span from the early 19th century um, to present day. Um, we also have an oral history collection. It's not digitized yet, but we are in the process of doing that and it will be made available on our website. Um, our obituaries, as well as our vast uh, newspaper collection are available on our website, which is rijha.org. Um, and you can view that without subscription or being a member or anything. If you wanted to look at that, you're more than welcome. Um, we do have some photos on our website, but we are in the process of recataloging and digitizing those. Um, so within the next year or two, hopefully that collection will be available to view on the website. Those are obviously great for researchers too. Um, but other than that, um, we are in the process of recataloging our entire collection into a digital cataloging system. So when researchers do put a request in, it will be much easier to look up names for genealogists. Um, so if you did have a request and wanted to look something up, all you have to do is either call us, send us an email, or you can submit a request through our form on the website. Other than that, I am going to turn it over to our next presenter. Caitlin, can you stop sharing? Hi everybody, I'm Elizabeth Rose from the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Hartford and I'm the representative from Connecticut in the New England Jewish History Collaborative and I see that we have a bunch of Connecticut people um, uh, on the call today, so welcome. Um, uh, the Hartford was, it was, is the second largest Jewish community in New England after Boston um, and um, the roots of the community here, of the Jewish community go back more than 300 years. Um, uh, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen here. There we go, so this is just a little bit about the Jewish Historical Society um, and our website, which is also on your handout. I wanted to highlight our oral history collection, which is really the heart of our collection and the main focus of um, the organization in some ways over the past 50 years has been to collect as many interviews as possible. And that's probably the resource that would be most um, interesting to genealogists. We're excited to be currently digitizing that entire collection, which involves hundreds of oral history interviews recorded over the past 50 years. And that will be searchable by um, name, keyword, and subject headings. Um, I'm just gonna stop the share and share the website for a moment just to show you what that could look like. Um, hold on. So from our website, um, which I have open here, if you go to archives and then you go to oral histories, you can navigate, right now it's just sorted by the first name of the individual. Um, so you can click on that person's name. And sometimes we have a photograph like this wonderful photograph here. Um, and you can either play it directly um, from that page or you can click where it says, listen with index guide to interview. And we're using a system called OMS, which enables you to have sort of a table of contents of the interview and then you can play whatever section you're interested in. So um, check back with us in um, 
uh, next spring, summer, we will have the entire collection available online at that point, and it will be more fully digitized than it is right now. Two uh, online exhibitions that um, we've recently done would offer very helpful context for anybody who has family roots around Hartford and is looking to understand a little bit more of the context. Um, these are also available on our website, but I'll just, from our website, but I'll just click um, quickly here to show you how this works. So um, it's an interactive map. So the map is on the right. Each of the dots represent an entry. And as you scroll down um, on the left, there's an introduction and then there's different sections that trace the different waves of immigration and Jewish presence in Hartford over the years. Um, so as you scroll down, it will take you to different places on the map. So it has sections uh, such as the uh, Central European immigrants making home downtown in the mid 19th century, and then a later section on the um, newer immigrants from Eastern Europe who um, set up a neighborhood more on the east side that's marked in green there, and then later move up here to the north end that you can see here. So each of these dots represents a synagogue, a business, a school, something like that. So it's meant as a, tour, a kind of a digital tour and overview that will um, be helpful for um, anyone trying to get more context about um, their family's, you know, experience perhaps in, in Hartford. There's a similar map for all the synagogues in Greater Hartford that operates in the same way. So I won't demo that for you, but it additionally will show you uh, in a line where that synagogue moved to. So where it started, where it moved to, so that you can get a sense of the movement of the population um, and the institutions of the community over time. In terms of our archives, like, um, like Rhode Island, we have records uh, relating to synagogues, to Jewish organizations, businesses, some records of families, not a, not a huge amount of that, um, schools, and all of these finding, finding aids for most of these collections are available on our website under the archives um, menu. We've also published several books, um, which could be helpful, again, looking for context of people's experiences. So we have two books that are drawn from the oral histories of people who grew up um, with families in mostly in the north end of Hartford um, and in other neighborhoods of Hartford. And then this book that you see here on Connecticut's Jewish farmers. Um, it's also drawn from oral histories and photographs. Um, so just to give you a couple glimpses of items in our collection, um, to give you an idea of the scope of it, this is a potato sack from uh, the Liebman farm in uh, Ellington, Connecticut, um, that represents that farming uh, history. Sophie Tucker, the entertainer, grew up in Hartford and kind of ran away to New York to make her, um, uh, to seek her fortune. Um, so we have a collection and an online exhibition about her as well. Um, we also have a feather from her, one of her hats, <laughs> I think. Um, this National Council of Jewish Women sort of represents the organizational legacy of, um, of different groups in Hartford. Uh, this is a gavel and an honorary thing that was given to uh, Herman Koppelman, who was the first Jewish uh, city council member. Um, and this Yiddish typewriter is a travel typewriter, which I think is a wonderful um, example of the flourishing of Yiddish culture through newspapers and other um, literature in you know, Jewish communities, including Hartford. So, um, so that's just a little taste of what our organization and our collection is about. And if you have um, research requests, um, you can definitely contact us through our website and we would, should be able to get back to you within a week or two weeks at the most and be glad to help if we can. I'm gonna turn it over to Harris Gleckman from uh, Documenting Maine Jewry. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, greetings to all those who've indicated that they're from Maine, they have had relatives in Maine. Um, I wanna share with you some of the resources that we have put together as part of this regional um, collaboration. Um, sorry, I hit the wrong choice here. Let me try again. Um, yes, fine. Um, so 
What you're seeing is the uh, home page of our website. Unlike other of the collections, we are entirely vir virtual. Everything that is here is online. And I want to share two reasons why this has been uh, a pleasure to do, but an interesting source is that we are able to approach families and say, please share with us photographs, documents, materials that you have and scan them, put them in the public record and you can keep them or you can put them in a repository. As you will see later, we've also set it up so that it's interactive, so that we really crowdsource and take advantage of the knowledge that people have who come on to our uh, protected site, secure protective site. Um, so let me give you a flavor of what is available. We really take a focus on communities. These are the communities that are currently functioning in Maine. And for each community, there's a listing of the Jews who have ties to that community, burial records, Jewish organizations, and bibliographic and, bio and census data. Um, not only are there current communities, but we document former Jewish communities. And these are the, the former Jewish communities in the state. So what do we have from them? We will work with anything that is digitized. So at the moment, as you can see, we have some 3,400 photographs. Our oral history collection um, is, is available. We have collections of obituaries, which we are about to increase by a collection provided to a colleague organization in Bangor for another 900 obituaries. We have Jewish community records. We have commemorative histories. Um, and it is drawing from as many sources as possible. And as we are a crowdsourcing space, we invite the people who take part in it, particular interests in Jewish history to house their material either on our site or on their space and we document and link to it. Um, sorry, I need to move between screens here and I now have a difficulty. Um, well, I'm gonna jump a little bit because I have to get rid of this thing on top. I can't, um, just hold, bear with me for a second. Um, so what we also do is we break the material down by decades. And if you're interested in the resources and get a perspective of where Jewish life is in Maine in the 1940s, we have the resources available. You click for any given year, plus or mi minus two years from that period of time, a quick history of Jewish life and the resources that we have for that area. One of the things which is a bit unusual about Maine and which provides a lot of ties for people to coming to Maine from outside the area are the summer camps here. And we, in conjunction with the Maine Jewish Museum, did a project looking for summer camps and trying to document them with photographs and histories. And this index um, contains about 85 different summer camps, which have been in Maine. From a, a genealogical perspective, of course, we work on individual data. And I'm showing you now, for, with privacy concerns, my grandfather's entries, where we build up slowly people by, by person, person by person, what we have collected, their genealogical, their migration, their occupations, where they've lived, their central places in the states where they are, important communication, community organizations they've been part of, we are also, for those who are looking, a statewide repository of all Jewish burials in all 16 Jewish cemeteries. And here are the various um, links to materials of photographs or others from, from that person. 
as I indicated at the beginning, we're interactive. So if you came onto our site, you have to be a registered person to do so. All of these fields are, can be edited. So if you happen to know more about the education of my grandfather, you can put it in here and then save it. This gives a way in which we reach out and regularly ask people to contribute to expand our holdings of a genealogical and a historical and a community history approach. As I said at the beginning, we are a community-based approach and we're amongst others working with the Maine Jewish Museum and for them have done a history of the synagogues around the state. And you can look at on, through our website of the Maine Jewish Museums, the history of the specific congregations. And so I welcome you to take advantage of our resources. And I welcome you to, if you have hidden in your attic, things which you can scan, that you can add, we welcome it because it's a virtual space and we find it very helpful to build our resources in this fashion. So let me pass you now um, on, on to Lindsay. Hi all, um, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, yes, okay. So um, first I'm gonna brief, and as Rachel and Ellen had introduced me previously, I'm Lindsay Spreckman Murphy, and I'm the senior archivist at the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center. Lindsay, um, we, don't, we don't see you. Oh, okay, and you can see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so first, I'm going to briefly talk about the two main ways that you can access our information about our collections, our website, and our digital library and archives. Um, and just a note, we're currently working very hard on a new website that should be launching next month, early next month. So things by then might look a little bit different, but the content should be all the same. And links for everything I'm going to show and talk about should be on the handout that um, you have been provided with. Um, and lastly, before I start, I just want to um, say that I have a lot to talk about and of course, you know, unlimited time. So um, for a more in-depth discussion about what the JHC offers for genealogical research, um, I have an hour long webinar on the same topic um, and the link for that is also in the handout provided to you. So here is um, the homepage for our website, jewishheritagecenter.org, and you can find out a lot of information about us there. Um, and here is where you can find a list of all of our archival finding aids, all 259 of them. I know um, a couple other presenters today have mentioned finding aids, but if you're not familiar, finding aids are guides or maps to archival collections, and they're created by archivists um, to tell researchers what's in a collection and where to locate materials within that collection. It's an aid to help you find information and materials, hence the name finding aid. And on our, this uh, website, our finding and repository, you can actually filter our collections by different subjects. So here you can filter by Boston, you can filter by photographs, you can filter by languages, um, and also you can filter by organizations, you can filter to all benebarits, for example. And you can also in this um, search within results field, you can do a general keyword search. So, you know, if you're looking for a particular um, town for example, in Poland, um, you should go ahead and type it in here and see if there's any collections that are related that mention that town. Um, and here's an example of a finding aid. And um, this is for the Crawford Street Shul in Roxbury, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and you can see it provides you with important information that provides context to the collection. Um, and it includes an overview, the dates it covers, a historical note, um, the languages you can find in the collection, and a lot more. And our finding aids also have container lists, um, which list everything the collection contains in an organized fashion. So the container list tells you exactly what's in a collection and where exactly in the collection you could find what you're looking for. So for example, this is for the Crawford Street Shul, 
if your ancestor was a member at the shul and was part of their brotherhood, um, you know, you might be interested in seeing the brotherhood members and officers list, which we know from the finding aid is in box one, folder two. And our next main access point is our digital library and archives, which I'll just refer to as DLA from now on. And as you can see, we share with um, American ancestors, special collections and their research library. So our DLA provides access to our digitized collections to you at home. And we have about 1.2 million documents digitized and approximately 700,000 available online for research. And here are some of the types of collections that are available on our DLA. Um, some are just one collection. For example, you can see here that there's just one collection for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society Boston Port records. And some are based on theme. Like here, there's a, there'll be a group of collections that are related to rabbinical synagogue and Jewish education papers. And when you click on one of those squares, um, you'll see all the collections that are digitized in that theme um, and they're all available to view. And we do have a couple of collections that on our DLA that do not require a guest user account to gain access, but most do, and it's completely free. You just have to create a guest user account and instructions for how to do that are on the handout as well as on our website. So now um, that I've gone over the main ways you can access our archives, I'm going to quickly delve into specific collections that might be useful for you for genealogical research. Um, first is the Rabbi Bear Barakoff papers. He was a rabbi in Malden, Massachusetts, and his collection contains eight ledgers, which recorded the uh, more than 1400 marriages he officiated. So if your ancestors were members of that synagogue or were married in Malden, it's definitely worth taking a look at. Um, the ledgers provide great information like maiden names, occupations, parents' names, and places of birth. And there are a couple ways to access this collection. One is that it's completely digitized on our digital library and archives, but it is not indexed or searchable, but you can certainly browse it and it is in chronological order. Alternatively, um, they're also available on Jewish Gen, uh, the Rabbi Bear Barakoff marriage database, and also on Ancestry.com. Those are both um, searchable and indexed, but you can't view the images, so they kind of work together. Next is the Rabbi Aaron Gorovitz papers, and he was a rabbi at a number of small Boston area congregations, but most notably at Congregation Sons of Abraham in Roxbury, Boston, Massachusetts. And the collection contains eight ledgers in which he recorded the nearly 1,000 marriages that he officiated. And they provide similar information um, as other marriage ledgers do. But this one in particular actually provides the birthplaces of all four parents of the couple, which is uh, really great information. And similarly to the Bear Barakoff papers, um, this, these records are completely digitized and accessible on our digital library and archives, but they're not searchable and not indexed. And also similarly, they are available on Jewish Gen and on ancestry.com. And finally for Rabbi's papers, there's the Rabbi Itzik Benkovitz papers. And he was a rabbi at two Chelsea synagogues during his long career. He lived to over a hundred years old. And his records contain three ledgers in which he recorded the 305 marriages he officiated. They are digitized, indexed, and searchable as a JHC slash American Ancestors database. Um, which you can access on AmericanAncestors.org, but you do need a JHC or American Ancestors membership to access. Alternatively, they are also on Jewish Gen um, and uh, are available for you to look there. They're searchable index there as well. So synagogue records, as you can imagine, are also can be a great um, source of genealogical research. Materials like newsletters and bulletins, meeting minutes, dedication booklets, all those types of things record things like births, marriages, bar and bat mitzvahs, and other life cycle events. 
So we have 38 synagogue collections, 31 in Massachusetts, four in Connecticut, two in Rhode Island. Um, that could certainly have, if your ancestors were members of those particular synagogues, they certainly might be found in there. Um, and 15 of those collections are digitized and are accessible on our DLA. And you could view a list of all the synagogue collections we have on our website. And similarly, organizational records also record important things in meeting minutes, newsletters, membership records. Um, and we have a lot of organizational records, but the main categories of ones we have are women's organizations like Hadassah's, fraternal societies like local chapters of B'nai B'rith's, JCCs, um, youth groups like YMHAs, immigration aid societies, and labor organizations like Workman Circle. And once again, you can check out all our organizational records on our website, and many, many of them have been digitized and are searchable and available on our DLA. Um, so one collection that I feel like I feel is worth spending some more time on to talk about specifically is our highest Boston Port records. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, it was and still is an organization founded in 1881 dedicated to, among other things, um, aiding Jewish, but later also other uh, refugees. It helped to do things like secure affidavits, secure sponsorships for um, you know, Jews fleeing Europe, um, helped get appropriate paperwork done, helped find missing relatives and a lot more. And I just wanna point out that um, this collection contains records specifically to the highest Boston branch, which was a separate and autonomous branch of highest than the national organization. Highest Boston um, closed in the 70s. So um, it's really limited to people who lived in and settled or came through Boston. If your ancestors came through Ellis Island and never stepped foot in Boston, they're probably not gonna be in here. Um, so there are a few types of records in the highest Boston records um, that contain valuable genealogical information. Um, the first of which is case files which are essentially folders on passengers and their families, if applicable, who received assistance through Highest Boston. And these case files, you can find things like naturalization forms, correspondence, affidavits, tracers, and so much more. And naturally, they provide really great genealogical information. And we have over 14,000 of these case files. And we're currently working on digitizing them all. Right now, we have about 50% of them digitized and on our digital library and archives. And other parts of the collection that might interest you are arrival cards and ship and ship arrivals and passenger lists. Currently, we have 24,000 of these arrival cards, um, which, as you can imagine, are cards that document the arrival of Jewish immigrants, both individuals and families who passed through the port of Boston. Um, and ship arrivals and passenger lists are some of our earliest highest Boston records. And um, they mostly were ledgers that recorded all the Jewish passengers on arriving ships. And sometimes they also um, document deportation proceedings. So how can you find if a relative of yours is in the highest Boston records? So using our finding aid, you can see a list of all 14,000 case files. Um, and you can see here, I found that Fanny Perkins has a case file on her. And if you click on it, you can see that Fanny Perkins, the case file on Fanny Perkins is located in box 110, folder 70. And um, you can also, instead of having to look through all 14,000 case files, um, you can also use the search bar to search for a name. And here you can see I've searched for Perkins and two case files contain the name Perkins and they both show up. So um, you can access the contents of an individual case file using our DLA. And one way you can do that is to simply um, type in a name on the search bar. So here again, I've searched for Perkins. And here are the results. 
So we have an Alexander Perkins and Fanny Perkins, who is what I was looking for. But you might wonder why this Fanny Israel is showing up when I search for Perkins. And I'll show you why. So here on the left, on my left, at least, we have um, the case file for Fanny Perkins. And you can see there's, there's three pages of it. And here over um, on the right, we have the metadata that us archivists create for each and every case file. And for this specific collection, we create enhanced specialized metadata to capture information, not only on who the case file is on, so not only on Fanny Israel, um, but also um, on all the people referenced in the file. So um, here, so looking at, um, so you can see here that Sophie Perkins is listed among other people, is listed as an associated name. So that's why this case file is showing up when I search for Perkins. And if you look at the documents, and if you know how to read this correctly, it actually is showing that Sophie, Sophie Perkins is Fanny Israel's mother, her maiden name. So this is why I encourage you all to search our DLA, because by searching it, um, you're not only finding out information about the person who the case file was created for, but also every, all relatives, acquaintances, friends, bosses, everyone listed in all 14,000 plus case files. And one thing to keep in mind is that we only upload highest case files that are older than 72 years old. So that means currently only case files from 1949 and earlier are available, but you can certainly reach out to us to access more recent cases or cases that aren't yet digitized. As I mentioned, about 50% of them are digitized. So, um, you know, there's still 50% that aren't, but we're working on scanning and uploading more every single day. And then um, quickly on, besides individual case files, um, you can access the other highest records um, through a couple ways. Um, so our, the arrival cards, the 24,000 um, index size cards, they aren't digitized on our DLA, but both Jewish Gen and Ancestry have databases that have indexed and made searchable the arrival cards. And the ship arrivals and passenger lists are actually uh, digitized, indexed, and searchable on um, AmericanAncestors.org as a JHC slash American Ancestors database. Um, and for that, you do need to be a JHC or American Ancestors member. And then two more quick things are that we have a couple of runs of newspapers and probably don't have to explain why newspapers can be such a great genealogical resource. Um, so we have the Jewish Times, which served the Jewish community of Boston, Massachusetts. And we have digitized and searchable issues from 1945 to 1992 on our digital library and archives. And we also have bound volumes of the Jewish Weekly News, which served the, community, the Jewish community of Western Massachusetts, as well as the Jewish Journal, which served and continues to serve um, the Jewish community of Massachusetts North Shore. And both the Jewish Weekly News and the Jewish Journal, as I mentioned, are bound, so, and they're not yet digitized, so you will need to access those in person. And last thing are databases. Um, I already talked about a few, but through the JHC and American Ancestors, we offer seven databases related to Jewish family history. Um, and they're all listed here. And the three that have stars are the ones that don't require a JHC or American Ancestors membership, and the rest of them do. So that's it for me. Um, and I will give it back to Ellen. Thank you, Lindsay. Before we start with um, Q&A, I just want to demonstrate for you how you can find Jewish Gen's USA Research Division. From the home page, if you click on Research and then Research Divisions, you'll see a list of all of Jewish Gen's research divisions. If you click on United States right here, it brings you to this red, white, and blue Jewish Gen USA Research Division. Um, I'd like to invite you to surf around 
uh, particularly under research and resources, we have um, created lists of extensive links to archives around the United States, some searchable databases and lists that are available through other websites rather than through Jewish Gen. There's a section specifically on early American Jews if you're interested in that period. Um, there are links to Jewish historical societies upcoming and past Jewish Gen talks that are part of this series on researching Jews in America. I'll just pitch that our next one is scheduled for Wednesday, November 10th, when we will have a panel describing ways to research Jews who served in the US military in all conflicts, starting with the Revolutionary War and all the way through the present. We have some links to Jewish newspapers, the oldest synagogues by each state in the United States and other valuable links. You can also get to Jewish Gen's USA database from our website. And when you scroll down, you can see by state what collections are included. So certainly under Massachusetts here on the right-hand side, many of the, the data sets that Lindsay described are right here. And you can search them by name or by year from Jewish Gen. As far as New England goes, we also have some material from Connecticut. There's a newspaper obituary database, and we are continuing to acquire new data collections, which brings me to my pitch that if you would like to suggest a project that is New England based and has genealogical value, you can do that as an individual or as part of your Jewish genealogy society or any other group and we would welcome your participation. Going back to our uh, research division, if you look on our website, you'll see there's a drop down where there's a form for volunteers under about right here to volunteer. You can fill out a form about your interest and availability and our volunteer coordinator, Eli Savato, will get back to you with a project or a time frame. So I invite you to take a look around, send me an email if you have any questions or fill out the volunteer form if you'd like to get involved. And with that, Avrami, I'm going to pass it on to you. Do we have any questions for the panel? Hey, uh, thank you. I'll just pull up my video. Thank you everyone for this very informative uh, program. Each of the presentations uh, had a lot to offer, and I thank you very much for all the preparation that clearly went into this. Um, we have a few questions that I will read out and uh, please take as, as relevant. Uh, a recent question was, do port records have all Jewish immigrants through the Boston port? And if so, for what years? So I'm assuming that's about the highest Boston port records. Um, so um, I'm sure that it's not 100% of all Jewish immigrants to the Boston port, but I, they really tried to capture every single one that they could. Um, the collection technically runs from 1886 to 1977, but the majority of the um, cases in the documents are between 1938 and 1954. But we don't have things, we don't have much from the 1800s and certainly don't have things before the late 1880s. Thank you. There's a question about um, historic buildings. Um, where might somebody look um, to identify where the person has a photograph and there's a building in the background? So I'm wondering if there's a way to help identify where these photographs are taken and to try to identify buildings. If anybody wants to take that one. Do we know what state the inquiry is for? Um, the person thinks it's in Rhode Island. Oh, I think I saw that comment. Um, if that person wants to send me an email, um, I can um, I can look at the photo and see if I can you, I think you mentioned in the comment that there was the name of a uh, of a store or something in the photo. Um, we might be able to find it from a city directory or something um, and maybe find a street address and go from there. Um, if you want my email, 
um, I can, you can either look on the RIJHA website or uh, it's just info at RIJHA.org. Thank you. And I, um, could I just add to that? that? That's also Sorry, um, that's also a great opportunity to plug the collaboratives website that has compiled um, lots of resources and repositories by state. So um, yes, you could go straight to Caitlin. You could also, if you're poking around online, um, go to that website, which will include, you know, university collections um, and other um, other repositories in Rhode Island that might. Um, you know, have photo collections, for instance. Um, so there, there are different ways to approach that. Harris, you're you're muted. Harris, you're on mute. Dr. Minding Manjuri also maintains a Facebook page, and we find it very interesting is to post what we call mystery photographs. Sometimes we get sent camp photographs where someone can identify just some people, or there's a street image, and we put it up and there's a dynamic because of crowdsourcing. Someone says, I know exactly who that person is, or I know the locale. And uh, one of the, beside the Facebook, we also have on our website a whole category called mystery photographs, and people are frequently looking at it as part of a game, but it also produces knowledge for the rest of us. Thank you. I'll mention that in the handout uh, has everybody's contact information. Um, so I, the, the link to the handout is in the chat um, and it was also emailed out to you. So you can take a look at that. Um, there's a question that the handout didn't reference anything for New Hampshire. Um, does anybody have recommendations how people could research their roots uh, in the state of New Hampshire? I would just encourage to, to look again at the New England Jewish uh, Collaborative website, which does have a section on New Hampshire and the resources that were identified there are, are listed there. And the JHC does have a few collections on New Hampshire. So I'd recommend looking at what we have on, on New Hampshire as well. I really seen too many more general questions. Uh, there is actually, there's a question on uh, Landsmannschaften records from civic societies. Um, the various archives have those type of records and how would somebody find them? Um, so at the JHC at least has a number of Landsmannschaften records. Um, you can find them on our website. Um, for example, we have one for Moretz um, or Merkin in Lithuania. Um, the Boston chapter, uh, we have the records for that. So I would just, um, you know, search all the archives and see what collections they might have. Okay. Um, I'm just looking in the chat because I see some people posted there. Okay. Um, I think we'll wrap up here unless anybody on the on any of the panelists want to add anything before we before we sign off. Okay, so thank you to all of our panelists for today's program. Thank you to everyone who logged in and participated. Uh, we had uh, more than 360 people who were with us today. Um, the session has been recorded and we will try to get that up on our YouTube channel. When it's done, we'll post a link on our discussion group. Please feel free to share the link in your own networks and social media and email lists. Uh, let people know that this has taken place. Um, as Ellen mentioned, the next uh, webinar in our series will focus on military and we'll send out a link when uh, registration is live. And I uh, wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you again for participating. Thank you.